this thing working here? I haven't tested this out yet. Give it just a second. Yeah, right on. Come on in. Where, I'm, where I come from, that, that's the way we talk. Um, I know that there might be some English scholars out there that are saying it's not proper English. You've got too many words. You can just say, come in. You don't need the on in there. No, no, no. Where we come from, it's come on in. All right? You know, you know I speak two languages, English and bad English. Okay? And so, this... Uh, I, I just mentioned this, and I, and I bring this out, and I, I, I want to leave you with this phrase, and I hope maybe people will start using it, but I, I want you to know that I feel like this is a word from God to you, to me. Come on in. I used to go over to my grandparents' house on Sundays. My dad would send me over there, and he said, go mow your grandpa's lawn. Go help him in the garden. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, and I get there, I'd knock on the door out of habit, and Grandpa would call out, "Come on in." I mean, he knew who it was. But did you ever have like a family member or a friend, or maybe you, when you have people come over that you have certain things that you say or do? Maybe at your house, like you're supposed to take your shoes off when you come in the door. I know my aunt's house, that's the way it was. My, my Uncle Tony and my Aunt Sharon, that when you came to the house, I mean, they got new carpet put in their house. You had to take off your shoes before you went in. They want to keep, that, keep it nice and clean. But there was something about that idea of just come on in. Like the door's open. It's unlocked. Come on in. You're welcome here. Grandma's got sandwiches. she got Kool-Aid. Come on in. Don't just stand out there on the porch and wait for us to, to do anything more. No, you're already here. I already want you to come in. It's, it seems natural at Grandma's house. But for some reason, for many people, and maybe you struggle with this like I do, it's hard when it comes to the throne of God. It's hard to just go in. Maybe you're like me and you have struggles with your prayer life. Have you ever stopped, you know, you're a believer, I know you love God and you're trying to follow him, but you ever just stopped and think, man, I don't pray near as much as I should. Man, sometimes I have a hard time finding time to pray taking time to pray and we hesitate we sit on the front porch and sometimes some of us we sit on the front porch and we complain to the door instead of just going right on in and getting our problems taken care of and, and presenting our requests to God some of us we stand outside the house and we complain to all the neighbors all the people that are in proximity to God. You know anybody like that? Maybe I, I'm like that sometimes. There are times where I'm sitting and I will be with maybe some of the deacons or the elders or with some of my friends and I'll talk about all my problems with my friends, with my neighbors, and then forget to just go on into God and tell him about it. We all struggle with this. I want to be realistic about it. You need to be real and honest with yourself. You probably do the same thing. We need to realize and we need to hear today that the invitation has been opened and he has said to us, come on in. Come to me. You read it earlier. Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden. Come. Whoever's thirsty, come. Whoever's needy, come. Whoever's joyful, come. Whoever has sorrow, come. Come on in. I told Mark something earlier. It really made me laugh. I said, uh, I'm going to do something different, and uh, I'm going to bore everybody at the beginning of my sermon. He's like, how's that different than any other time? <laughs> I was like, you know when you put your foot in it, and like... 
Open mouth, insert foot. I set myself up like that sometimes. But seriously, there's a passage of scripture that I want to read, and I'm going to speed read through it. And so forgive me. The words are going to be up on the screen, but I'm going to read all of Exodus chapter 29 real quick. As quick as I can, I'm going to mow through this. But the reason I want to do this is I want to illustrate a point. And then I'm going to actually get to my sermon. But I'm going to read this passage of Scripture. Just, uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to read this to you to show you how hard it is to get into the presence of God. This is what God commanded Moses to the high priest Aaron, what was supposed to happen, just for Aaron to go and minister to the Lord. In Exodus 29, it starts there in verse 1. Okay, so I'm going to read this really quick. This says, now this is what you shall do to consecrate them. He's talking about the priests, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breast." Peace and gird him with skillfully woven band of the ephod, and you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them, and you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Then you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar and you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat as that is on them and burn them on the altar. This is kind of messy. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Then you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall kill the ram and shall take its blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. Anybody getting grossed out yet? All right, 17, then you shall cut the ram into pieces and wash its entrails and its legs and put them with its pieces and its head and burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. The Lord loves barbecue. I say this for a fact. You're burning a ram on the altar with fire. Now, flesh from animals has a distinct smell when you burn it. Mm -mm. He says it's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. I love the smell of barbecue too, all right? Verse 19, you shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. There's a lot of laying of hands on these rams, and it wasn't for healing for these rams. Mm. And you shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tips of the right ears of his sons and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the great toes of their right feet and throw, not pour, not lovingly place, throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. This is a mess. Do you see what's happening here? This is in your Bible. There's some people that never read this before. This is a bloody, messy ritual. Look, this is just a side note. There are powers and spirits and all kinds of entities and things going around in this universe that most people would be horrified if they knew about it. You know what? And some of you, like if I was to stand up here at this pulpit and someone was sick and I was to say, hey, I took a chicken and I had that person grab the chicken by a head and we pray the spirit of infirmity into this chicken. Then I brought the chicken up here and cut its head off in front of everybody. Y'all be like, are we in a voodoo cult or something like that? Have you read your Bible? Do you know why voodoo practitioners of voodoo cut chicken heads off? Mm. There's a spiritual principle at work in this scripture here. Some people think voodoo's not real. I'm not saying you should start practicing voodoo. Don't go study it. 
that will bring you into a lot of weird things. But I'm telling you right now, there are things done in the Scripture because there are things that our eyes cannot see that are happening. They're laying their hands on these rams and then killing the rams. What do you think's happening when they touch these rams and these bulls? I mean, people, there are people that are looking at me right now that's like, oh, well, that's, that's not Christian. We don't cut off chicken heads and bulls, and that, we don't do that kind of stuff anymore. In the New Testament... Jesus cast out a demon from a man, actually several demons, maybe hundreds of demons out of a man, and they went into a herd of pigs. Do you remember what happened to the pigs? They drowned. You think that that was an accident? These are spiritual principles that you ought not to play with. This is not to be toyed with. There are many people that try to practice these dark arts. They call it the left-hand path. It's actually, it's a twisting and a perversion of the Old Testament law. Voodoo practitioners to this day still do these very things. Where they lay hands, they try to heal the sick by casting out unclean spirits into animals, and then they kill the animals as a sacrifice. This is a reality in our world. People have been practicing this for thousands of years. But we know that in Christ, we know that in Christ, our sacrifice has already been made. We don't have to do these bloody rituals anymore. Let me go ahead and move on. Verse 21, it says, Then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments. This is a messy ritual. Blood and oil. Sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and his sons' garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Anybody here grow up on a farm? with animals, had to uh, slaughter pigs and chickens and cows, and have you ever seen it done? Have you ever been inside of a barn or a slaughterhouse that much blood and, and, and all these kinds of things have been poured out? You remember the smell of that place? You know that in the temple place, in the tabernacle where, where God is telling them to do this, you know that they did this kind of ritual day in and day out? This is not even including all the stuff that the people brought to them. This is just for the priests. This doesn't include the people's offerings that they did day and night. They were continually sacrificing and doing rituals like this day and night. Let me move on. You shall also take of the fat of the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and the right thigh for it is a ram of ordination and one loaf of bread and a cake of bread made with oil and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You shall put all these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Then you shall take them from their hands and burn them on the altar on top of the burnt offering as a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is a food offering to the Lord. You shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. You shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering that is waved and the thigh of the priest's portion that is contributed from the ram of ordination what, for what, uh, from what was Aaron's and his sons, and it shall be for Aaron and his sons as a perpetual due from a... Is anybody else getting tired? I'm getting, is it as tiring listening to me read this as it is for me to actually read it? Like, I'm starting to get tongue-tied up here. This is a lot of stuff. Yeah, 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 that's a lot of stuff. This is a lot of stuff they got to do. Man, it shall be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings. Their contribution to the Lord, the holy garments of Aaron, shall be for his sons after him. They shall be anointed in them and ordained in them they got to wear their daddy's clothes. Not only do they got to wear their daddy's clothes, but they got to wear their daddy's clothes that has had ram's blood sprinkled on it. They're in the desert, mind you. Now, I don't have time to go into all these scriptures, but no issue of man, that's the King James word, the idea of an issue of man, which is sweat, tears, urine, feces, semen, these kinds of things. Anything that the body produces and comes out of the body the scriptures say that no issue of man was allowed to go into the tent of meeting. In other words, these guys that are doing all these rituals, they had to do all these things and go into the tent of meeting and not break a sweat. How impossible is this beginning to sound to you? You realize how 
hard it is to go into the presence of God. This is what they had to do to get ready to go in the presence of God. See, we talk about God being good, but people in the church have forgotten that God is not only good, but God is holy. He's pure. He's undefiled. He's perfect. And there's so much work we have to do in order to get ready just to meet with him. The son who succeeds him as priest who comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place shall wear them seven days. You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. And Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration, but an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh for the ordination or of the bread remain until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Through seven days shall you ordain them. And every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. Like you had the bull and you had the couple rams. Now he says for seven days, every day you're going to offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. You see how much work this is? Also, you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it and shall anoint it to consecrate it. Not only do you have to burn these things and offer these offerings, but every time you do it, you have to wash the altar off and anoint it with oil to prepare it for the next offering. So you're doing all this bloody work and you're throwing blood on the sides of the altar, smearing it with blood, and then after that one's done, clean it all up. That's what he means by purify the altar, to wash it. And start over. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall become holy. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs, a year old, day by day regularly. So in addition to the bull for the sin offering, also for the altar, just for the altar, that the altar you're using so it can be holy. Two lambs a year, the year old, day by day regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. You only got 24 hours in the day, and hmm, I count up at least in one day, we're at seven different animals. How long do you think it takes to slaughter the animal and to clean its entrails and to burn it on the altar? How long does it take for the altar to burn that animal completely up and then clean the altar to do it again? We're already at seven animals. That doesn't even include all the other offerings that the people are giving. This is just for the priests. Think about it. And some people wonder why we praise Jesus so much for what he did. You realize how much he's freed us from? We think it's just our sins. Man, he's freed us from a lot of work, too. I'm going to go on. Let me skip down a little bit. I know it's taking a while here. There's, there's a grain offering, oil, and wine offering. Another, another grain offering and drink offering. And there's a regular burnt offering that's done there. Look there in verse 42. It says, it shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance. At the entrance. You haven't even gone into the temple yet. You haven't even gone into the tent yet. At the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting in the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. Verse 45, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. You know what? We haven't even mentioned all the sacrifices that had to be done in order to cleanse the table, the incense altar, the candlestick and the rituals with it. We haven't even talked about how Atonement was made for the Ark of the Covenant. There's this place, for those of you that are not familiar, in this tent of meeting that the Lord is talking about that I've just read here, 
was this huge tent. You've heard the word tabernacle. It's what it's talking about. There's this huge tent that was in the wilderness. There was also a permanent one that was built in Jerusalem. We call that the temple. So the temple is the permanent brick building made with stone where these rituals were done. But the temporary one was the tent, the tabernacle. This went around with them as they wandered in the desert. And in this place, there was this box that was made from wood and overlaid with gold. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. And this ark was placed in this tent in this back room that had a veil, a curtain, that separated it from everything. There was no artificial light inside the Holy of Holies, which was that inner room. It's called the Holy of Holies, where this Ark of the Covenant was. Inside that box was the tablets of stone the law was written on, and Aaron's rod, which had budded. It was a dead rod that these buds had came off of to show that Aaron was to be the high priest, to show his authority. These things were contained in Even the manna that came from heaven that fed them in the wilderness was contained in this box. And all these rituals were done so that way once a year, only once a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, one time a year, the high priest, after doing all these rituals, could take blood into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God rested on that Ark of the Covenant. And he would go in the presence of God and he would offer that blood as an atonement for the sins of the people. All these sacrifices, all these rituals, and he can only go in to see God's presence and his glory once a year. That's it. All this work for one short meeting. Think about that. Do you realize the privilege and the grace and the mercy God has given to us? Don't you realize we don't have to do all this stuff? We can go to God right now. We can experience his presence right now. Let me show you why. Hebrews chapter 9 says this in verse 11. When Christ appeared as a high priest... See, Aaron was the high priest of the Old Covenant, but here it says Christ appeared as a high priest. When did he appear as a high priest? Do you ever remember Jesus going into the temple and offering sacrifices and putting blood on his right ear and on his right thumb? And Do you remember any of that? How, was, how did Christ practice being the high priest? How did he show that to us? It says he's the high priest of the good things that have come. Then through the greater and more perfect tent, this is referring to the tabernacle, that there is a greater and more perfect tent not made with hands. See, the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in the wilderness was built by the children of Israel, by Moses and Aaron. They used their hands to build this, but it speaks and says that Christ is the high priest of a greater and more perfect tent or tabernacle. Not made with hands. That is, it is not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places. Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. It's not this once a year thing where he has to do it over and over and over again. No, he went in one time with his own blood. He didn't need rams. He didn't need bulls. He didn't need no other thing. He went in with his own blood. If the blood of of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctifying for the purification of the flesh, that's a mouthful. Let me read that again. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctifying for the purification of the flesh, he's he's starting a statement. It it sounds like a broken statement because I haven't finished it yet. There's a comma, not a period there. Listen, he's making a comparison here. He's saying, if they were commanded in the Old Testament to use the blood of goats and bulls and to sprinkle with the ashes of a heifer and the sanctification for the purification of their flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, they did these rituals all the time, and they didn't last. They had to do them every day from sunup to sundown. There was an offering in the morning, an offering at twilight. Year round, and then once a year for sin, they went in. 
But Christ, when he came with his own blood, how much more will it purify our conscience from dead works that we might serve God? All sin is taken care of through his sacrifice. Listen, verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised in eternal inheritance. Let me stop there. He is the mediator of a new covenant. The best way to understand the new covenant is to contrast it with the old. See, the new covenant, we're in Christ. We can come right to God. How special is that to you unless you realize that in the old covenant, you couldn't go to God. You needed sacrifices and a high priest and all these rituals and all these things. And so what that shows us, that in the new covenant, we have better promises. We have better blessings than they did. That in Christ, this new covenant is so much better than the old. As a matter of fact, this new covenant is actually the fulfillment of the old. That Christ himself came and fulfilled the law. He told the Pharisees and Sadducees and he told the people. On the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill it. How did he fulfill it? When he offered his blood as a sacrifice at the cross. He's the mediator of a new covenant. And listen to this, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenants. In other words, his death has redeemed us from all the laws we broke under the old covenant. Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, he demonstrates a fulfillment of the old covenant by obeying the law, by being perfect in all his ways, and then offering the sacrifice for our sins. Now, why is it important that your sins be sacrificed for that you have forgiveness has anyone ever talked to you about that like i hear some people they talk about how much joy they have that their sins are forgiven and i ask the question like why why does it give you joy that your sins are forgiven listen i'm telling you right now if jesus came bled suffered and died just so i could be forgiven and that's it i don't want it for some of you you don't want you don't like the way that sounds Let me explain myself. If Jesus suffered and died just so I could be forgiven and that's it, I don't want it. You know why? Because that's not what he did. The scriptures declare that we have received forgiveness of sins that we might go to God. He's opened the way to God. The reason we need our sins forgiven is because God is holy. He's just. And if we go before him with our sins, he has to destroy us. He's a righteous judge. If you are a murderer and you have been declared guilty and you go in front of a judge and he does not sentence you to the proper proper sentencing and punishment, you would call that judge unjust. If I had all the proof in the world and, and even a confession from you that you were a murderer and that you hurt somebody and hurt their family and took somebody's life, And we're sitting in a courtroom, and that judge is like, well, I'm just so loving, and I'm so kind, and I'm a forgiving judge. I have grace and mercy, so I'm going to let you go free. You would look at that judge, and you say, that that judge is corrupt. He's letting a murderer go free. Friends, don't you realize that God has forgiven us? But he did not leave our sins unpunished. He meted out a sentence for our sins. He gave a punishment for our transgressions. And that punishment that we deserve because of our law breaking, that punishment we deserve because we're liars, we're thieves, we think bad thoughts, we lust, we take what doesn't belong to us, We talk bad about people and we treat people with hate. Because of all of our sins, he took that punishment and he placed it upon his only son, Jesus Christ. And he suffered that death and that punishment for us. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. He took my punishment for me. I have been forgiven that I might come to God clean, my conscience purged from all these dead works. Clear. To stand before in his presence. I mentioned a curtain. There was a veil. It's called the veil that separated that holy place where the presence of God resided in that tent, in that tabernacle, that place where God's glory was seen over the Ark of the Covenant. There was this curtain. And it says in Luke 23, it says, 
It was now about the sixth hour. Jesus is hanging from the cross. It says, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. Thank you, Luke, for your poetic imagery. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last that as Christ was dying, that curtain which separated us from the presence of God, it was torn in two, the scriptures say. You see that? While the sun's light failed, while the Son of God, the sun refused to shine in the sky, and I'm talking about that ball of fire in the heavens. It refused to shine in the sky. It was darkness over the whole land. And while the precious Son of God, the light of the world, was dying, just as there was darkness over the land, there was darkness over humanity. And the Son of God, the light of the world, his body failed and he died. And when he died, the scripture says the curtain of the temple was torn in two. That through his death, through his sacrifice, he has opened the way into God's presence for us. It's not just about your sins being forgiven. It's about you being able to hear God say, come on in. Come on in, the door is open. Come on in, the curtain is torn. Come on into the presence of God. Oh, hallelujah. I get a little excited, but when I think about what Jesus did for me, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, therefore, brothers, sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. That is through his flesh. It is through his flesh that he opened it up. It is through his flesh dying. His body was crucified. He's opened a new and living way for us. Look, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus Christ, let us draw near. Never forget that. This is not just about your sins being washed away, but your sins have been washed away and purified you that you may draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We've been sprinkled by Christ and his blood, and we've been washed by the word of God made flesh, Jesus Christ. That's why Christ could teach prayer the way he taught it. That's why he could tell his disciples, when you pray, say, our Father. Could you imagine? Maybe, maybe for those of you who remember having a good father, a good grandfather, could you imagine if I went to Grandma's house and I knocked on the door? <laughs> take his shoes off. Put on this ephod put on this breastplate and put on this turban and this crown. Take a bull and two rams and I want you to kill them. And while you're out there on the porch, go ahead and build yourself an altar out there on the porch, grandson. I'm like, Grandma, no, 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 I'm not done yet. You need to kill that bull. You need to kill that ram. You need to put some of that blood on your ear and on your thumb. Could you imagine if my grandma started saying that when I knocked on her door? Friends, we've been given a gift that is so precious. We've been given this, this Christ, this, this Savior who has washed us clean that we can just walk right in to God, the Holy One, the Just One, the Punisher of evil, the one who's supposed to destroy the wicked. He's opened a way and said, come on in, I'll clean you up. I'll make you pure so you can stand in my presence. I'll make you holy so you can commune with me. Do you realize what we've been given? Let us draw near. There's no reason to hang out on the front porch. You know, some people, we don't look at it that way. 
Nowadays, we don't look at it as though we got to do rams and bulls and, and wear this kind of clothing. We still have our sacrifices and rituals that we do thinking that that's what gets us into God's presence. I know people, unless you, listen, uh, if people come up and they start preaching like this, if you, there are some people that if they have a preacher that's like this, they're like, oh, my God, my Father, I thank you, Lord, that my, my bed is not my cooling board and that these four walls are not my grave. And, oh, Lord, when I go across, that river and I get to that other side and I know when I get there it's going to be no more bye bye but only howdy howdy. You know there are some people that if they hear that they think now we're in the presence of God. You realize that? That people have certain things that they need. They think if they do this, if they hear this, if it's done in a certain way then we're in the presence of God. Let me tell you right now, you don't need anything. You don't need no one. You don't need anybody tuning up at the altar and singing a certain way. You don't need any of that mess. You know what you need? You need Jesus Christ because it's in him that you can go into the presence of God. That's all you need is him. All you need is Christ. And you can go right into God. Have your prayers answered. Experience his presence. Have him fill you with his Holy Spirit. Amen. And Jesus teaches us this way. I'm going to end with this. He says, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. Now, I've heard a lot of people preach about asking, and I've heard a lot of people preach about seeking. When was the last time you heard people preach about knocking? I'm going to tell you right now. Knock on that door and you're going to get one of these. Come on in. Come on in. Because Jesus says, the one who knocks, it will be opened. You go right into God's throne room. You get down on your knees and you pray. You ask of him what you need. You tell him what you're feeling. And he hears you. Why? Because of the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. He's given us away. The only reason your prayers are heard is because of him. He says, I tell you. I tell you, I'm telling you right now, ask. He's not making up uh, something to make you feel good. He's not saying, well, here's, here's a quaint little saying. He says, I, I tell you. Look there in verse 9. I tell you. I'm telling you. Telling you right now. Ask. This is not a suggestion. This is not some just high theological, esoteric thing in this spiritual realm. No, he's, I'm telling you right now. You can ask. You can ask, you can knock, and have that door open. Look, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? You realize how ridiculous that sounds? If Charlotte came up to me, Daddy, Daddy, can I have some chicken? And I hand her a wood block. I hand her, you know, I tear off the, the, the back of a, the newspaper and hand that to her. Something that has nothing to do with it. How mean would that be? If you ask for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Ooh. I want to know what dad's got a scorpion in his pocket that he's ready to give. <clears throat> Anyways, ask for an egg and give a scorpion? Do you understand the ridiculousness of what he's saying? Ridiculousness. Some of you like that word. I like that word. Ridiculousness. This is the ridiculousness of what he's saying. That you would not do this. This is the assumption he's making. That you fathers would not do these things. And then he says, if you then, you fathers who are evil, who are unholy, you're not perfect like God is, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? How much more will the Father of lights, the Holy Perfect One, who, who gave His Son as a sacrifice for you, how much more will He give you His presence, His very Spirit, if you just talk to Him and ask? See, we had to do so much stuff just to get into the presence of God, and God is saying, now I want to put my presence in you. Ooh, that's, you ought to write that one down. I'm telling you, in the Old Testament, according to the old law, there were so many rituals we had to do, the high priest had to do, just to be able to go into the presence of God. And in Jesus Christ, God is saying, you don't have to come into me. I want my spirit to come into you. 
He's made you the tent. He's made you the tabernacle. You are the place. Know ye not, little children, know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? The only reason the holy, pure, undefiled Spirit of God can live in you is because you have been cleansed and forgiven of your sins. He's come into you, come into your life. Do you know him? Do you know this one I've been preaching about? Have you made a commitment to Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to him? Have you? I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Let me have everyone stand for a word of prayer. Right now, every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to ask you a question. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, and you want to follow him today, and you want to know this one who gave his life for you, you want to, you want to have the presence of God in your life, and, and, and you want him to, to walk with you and to live with you and to help you, I want you to raise your hand right now. Maybe you know him. Maybe you've made a decision for him. Maybe, maybe you've been baptized. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord and, and you've been backsliding. And you want somebody to pray for and you want, you want to just let somebody know, hey, I've been struggling. I need his presence in my life. I want you to slip your hand up right now. Just slip it up and put it right back down. No one looking. No one looking around. I want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. I see you. Father, you see these decisions. You know what people need. I don't have to tell you anything, Father. You know all things. You know everything. And I just thank you. I thank you that you're working and moving in people's hearts. I pray, Lord, for these who, who are struggling to follow you. And those who, who want to follow you, don't know you, Lord. I pray right now that you'd answer their prayer. That you would come into their life. And through your word, through your gospel, and through your Holy Spirit, that you would lead them and guide them in your way they would know Jesus Christ. Father, salvation comes from you. It's in your power. Pray, Lord, Lord, this morning you would just lead us, continue to guide us in Jesus' name. Listen. For those of you that raised your hands, I want to give you a second opportunity here. Christ makes a statement in the Gospels where he says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father. If you've never confessed openly in front of people that you believe, that you want to follow Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. I'm telling you right now, this is the safest place to do it. You go out in the world and you begin telling people that you follow Jesus, it's going to be a lot harder. Let's just be real. It's hard. It's hard to be a Christian. I mean, Salvation's easy. Jesus took care of that hard work. But let's be honest, following Jesus is not easy. I want to give you some opportunity right now to do the easy part. This is the easy part. But come forward and confess Christ. Just let people know you believe. Christ said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father. Be open about it. Amen. I know you are, brother. I know you tell everybody about Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to make that decision, to make that confession. We call it the great confession. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you've never been baptized, the scripture declares, repent from your sins, believe the gospel, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, washing them away, calling on the name of the Lord, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know I paraphrased a lot of different scriptures in that, but you got what I meant. If you've never been baptized in water, baptismal is ready. I'm ready. Maybe you say, hey, I didn't bring clothes. I'm not ready to get wet. We've got towels. We've got clothes. We can take care of that. There is nothing stopping you. Take that step of faith. We're going to sing a song here. Jesus is calling you to come to him. If you need to make a decision today, you need to be baptized, you need to make a confession today, I invite you to come as we sing. I'll be right down here waiting for you.